Welcome, everyone. I'm Glenn Howard, president of the Jamestown Foundation. We're happy that you're joining us for another episode of Eastern Approaches. This interview series is named after the famous book of the same name by former British diplomat, spy, and adventurer Sir Fitzroy MacLean. Each episode of Jamestown's Eastern Approaches features conversations with renowned experts on the most important geostrategic issues facing the United States and Eurasia, particularly those areas of Eurasia often missing in today's headlines. Today, we're speaking with Phil Breedlove, the former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, who is enjoying retirement somewhere in an undisclosed location on the Alabama-Florida border. Phil is a great friend of Jamestown and has always wonderful insights on Eurasia and NATO, and we're just delighted to have him share some time with us and talk about the year of 2021 and what it may bring for NATO and the challenges it faces from a rapidly modernizing Russian military. Phil, your experience as SACUR in 2014 during the Russian invasion of Crimea left a huge imprint on your mind in terms of how the United States and NATO are prepared to deal with the challenges posed by Russia. We have a new administration and a new year. What will 2021 offer in terms of challenges for NATO? Phil, I'm going to turn it over to you, so please share what are the challenges for NATO as you see it in 2021. So it's, it's new news and it's old news. Um, when I took over as the SACUR in the uh, summer of 13, of course, we were coming out of Afghanistan. So here we are again. And so when we came out of Afghanistan, we were able to convince the nations to wait on these cuts, allow us to uh, take some introspection and examine, are we ready for our Article 5 collective defense mission? It had been over 20 years since we had really focused on that. Um, and uh, many people are confused, but at that time we actually convinced the nations that that's what we should do. And we built the first of several large exercises to, to measure our ability to do our collective defense uh, mission. And um, of, of course, then in the spring of 14, Russia gave us all a reminder of what our mission was and that we had to be ready. And then across two um, summits, Wales and then Warsaw, we made probably the biggest structural changes to NATO that we've ever made. Now we find ourselves in another time of introspection. We find ourselves once again uh, looking at how, coming out of Afghanistan even deeper. What are the next steps to try to, to find a peaceful path forward with a recalcitrant Russia who has uh, now three times since 2008 used its land force to change internationally recognized borders in the Eurasian landmass, something that we thought Great powers were beyond when the wall came down, but they have reminded us now three times that they will use their army to change borders. And so we aren't we almost in the same place. We've got to determine what it is as we come out of Afghanistan and how that looks as we try to uh, hold some of the ground that we have made in Afghanistan and help Afghanistan to get to a peaceful resolution. And then now more than ever, we have to deal with a Russia that is in the attack in many different ways than we saw in uh, earlier years. And I'm talking about that, that series of, of actions or sub kinetic combat that some people call hybrid, some people call gray zone, some people, Mr. Gorosimov calls in, indirect means asymmetric methods. I like to call it war below the lines, meaning below the threshold of kinetic options. But here we have a Russia that has inserted itself into major elections in many nations in the West, certainly into our 2016 election and into our most recent election, their actions are willfully seen. We've seen them using old spyware to get at, meaning murder or eliminate uh, people in foreign capitals as big as London. 
uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe that it's sort of old news and new news. 2021 brings us to one more set of discussions about how are we gonna think about Afghanistan? What is it that we do to continue to try to hold on to the gains that we've made there? And now more than ever, as we are now doing, I think a good job of moving towards those readiness changes, those force posture changes that we determined would bring us closer to an article five response. Now we have to step up and determine how are we gonna answer this information warfare? How are we gonna answer this cyber warfare? How are we gonna answer Russia's heavy hand with energy, manipulating prices, pipelines, et cetera, as we saw them do in that cold, cold winter of 14, when they shut off gas to Ukraine and when they raised gas prices, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, Old news and new news, maybe. Well, there's one thing that's been um, one of your themes in, in conversations that we've had, and it's about the idea of NATO kind of transitioning from positional warfare uh, to adapting kind of increasingly to, to more mobility. Um, we had the full the gap uh, throughout the Cold War, I think, you know, we were, we're U.S. forces in, in West Germany were positioned for such a long time. And you've, uh, you've been talking about the importance of kind of, of NATO's uh, mobility. You're also a major fan of Jomini. Uh, and they've often emphasized that interior lines of communication are very, very strategically important. And it's one, and it's one advantage the Russians have over the United States in terms of mobility in Europe. So the, as the U.S. military has traditionally kind of uh, since since we're our intervention in, in Europe, in France in 1917, we, we have been increasingly an expedition, expeditionary type of military. So how does this kind of, your idea about positional warfare, the discussion about changing of US bases, pullbacks, um, a movement of NATO increasingly to the Eastern Europe, to the Black Sea region, where does all this fit? And how does the kinetic versus the non-kinetic aspects of warfare, which you often talk about, how does that affect also that ability for us to, do, to adapt to, you know, move away from positional warfare to one of where we've got to be mobile, we've got to move. Um, and and I'll, leave, I'll let you kind of share some thoughts on that. So, you know, you did mention the old dead guys, the Clausewitz and the Jomini. And Jomini is uh, the one who talks so much about, you know, this internal lines and Moscow and the spider network of roads and railroads that come out of there could be the definitional illustration of interior lines. And we saw this as they went into the Donbass and, 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 and then sort of hid inside of an exercise series their preparation for uh, their uh, um, seizure of Crimea. And so, um, of course, we on the NATO side of this, we have a horrible problem of exterior lines. They can fight from this hub of transportation. And as they did in Donbass, assemble almost every one of their ready battalion task groups to be ready if they needed them to put pressure on Ukraine and to, uh, to invade into the Donbass region. And so we got a real lesson in what Jomini wrote about uh, in the past. And how do we answer? You're not gonna like my answer because you just sort of gave me what you thought your answer was, which was moving from positional to mobility. I think it's both. I think it's both. We need some amount, especially of the heavy kit and preparatory kit in the forward areas where we expect to have problems. But you're right, we've got to become much more mobile. So a uh, short story, I hope I don't bore you. Back when young Captain Breedlove was the uh, TAC-P uh, Air Liaison Officer to 2nd Brigade 3rd Infantry Division, Kitzingen, Germany. We were down in the GDP, uh, in a place such that we were supposed to thrust north into the 
first operational group of Russia that was going from west to east towards industrial Germany. And back then, as we would exercise and move to the field and back, and we were really conscious of not only our positional warfare, but our movement to and ability to move to war fighting positions, just some very simple things. Every bridge had a roundel on it that would say how much tonnage could go across the bridge. Roads were rated and built for tracked vehicles to move around when they needed to. Audubons and Audubon bridges were prepared for the beating they take when uh, these kind of vehicles move through them. And part of the peace dividend of the last 25 to 30 years, we've lost that art and science. Uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges was really the champion of this as when he was my uh, army commander in NATO. And he uh, talked about uh, a military Schengen zone such that we could once again move freely. Even when we had the roads and bridges worked out, we had dropped the legal ability to move rapidly across borders, especially when we're carrying ammunition and things like that. And so we had built or just allowed uh, old laws to fall back in place that very much hampered the rapid movement of our forces. And we needed to regain that. And Ben Hodges put us through a series of exercises to see just how bad it was. It was horrible. It's still a problem. We're still working on it. I remember as I was leaving the sec gen, Jen Stoltenberg, every meeting would sit up and he would have a stoplight chart. These nations have greened their laws up. These nations are moving towards it there in the Ella and these nations have made no progress. And it was name and shame at every meeting to force the nations to get moving on, dropping these barriers to rapid movement in our, our rear areas. <coughs> Additionally, many of our railroad junctions, railroad offloads, uh, Audubon areas for unloading, many of our ports and some of our river areas We'd allowed all of those things that we would use to move kit around Europe to go fallow. And so we've had to take a look at every piece of our transportation infrastructure to make sure that we were ready to go. And then probably most hurtful to all of us is truly we as military men and women had lost the art of moving large formations to the fight. We couldn't do a reforger today like we did reforgers in the 70s and 80s. We've allowed our ships, our, um, our transport fleet, our commercial fleet that supports us, we've gotten, we've allowed that to degrade. We've allowed our air transport capability to degrade. We bought C-17s that were supposed to last us for 40 years and because of the movement to and from Afghanistan, we're wearing them out in less than half of that time. And so we have got structural issues that we have to address to remain and regain capable of rapidly moving force to the point of impact. Um, and as I said, we've got tactical things to do. One more silly story. Captain Breedlove, when he was in a column road marching with the M1A1s and the M and the Bradleys of 2nd Brigade 3rd ID, when we heard an air attack, we knew how, how to herringbone into the trees, take cover. We knew how to assemble and put up our short range air defenses to defend our column. This is an art that has been largely lost and we don't have enough short range air defenses to tactically cover all of our fielded forces. And so, We've got to regain some of the basic tenets of tactical and operational movement um, for these forces to get to the fight. And we will have to get to the fight. Even in today's increased um, uh, uh, NATO readiness, the 30-30-30 initiative, all of the things we did in the Wales conference to get the uh, uh, rapid uh, force up, all of these things, even taking them for granted, we still have a problem of getting the appropriate level of force 
to the fight at the same speed that Russia has the ability using interior lines on roads and railroads to bring force against us. I wondered all over that answer, Lynn. I hope that's what you're- No, right. no, I think it was a great, great answer. And, and there's a lot of questions to come out of that. Um, you, you mentioned the 430s. Um, since the concept of the 430s and military readiness of NATO forces was mentioned, it seems like we have two things that are moving here. Uh, one is the, the US force posture in Europe uh, and then you have the NATO forces themselves over the allied nations. And we've talked about uh, before the NATO response force that was created is supposed to be uh, highly mobile, but it's never been tested, never been deployed. Um, there's uh, command and control issues over who orders uh, and has military responsibility, can order that force into action. Uh, we still maybe don't have that worked out yet. Um, so you have the US posture uh, and then you have kind of what NATO is going, what's happening within NATO and uh, decisions over whether their own investments in, in, in modernization of forces. So the 430s was designed uh, to kind of get uh, NATO allies thinking about it, getting their forces ready to move in 30 days notice, uh, which is important. But the Russians, as you point out, have a, an interior lines of communication and they can move on a dime whenever they want at their own choosing. Um, so then that kind of creates the whole problem about where you mentioned earlier about kit and where you deploy the kit. Are you there? Are you ready for it? Uh, and, and, and we've made advances. I agree with you there. Um, NATO's done a lot of that um, in, in storing, but again, there's, there's still some shortages in some areas. So I, I thought your point was really brilliant about the C-17s being worn out uh, by travel back and forth to Afghanistan. A lot of people haven't thought about that. Um, and I think that there was kind of an aspect of the United States kind of re-posturing itself after Af getting, by getting out of Afghanistan to kind of refocus on the threat in Europe. But so at the end of the day, if the 430s and the other position, this idea of positional warfare are moving and becoming mobile, um, I mean, are you seeing the progress in American allies? Uh, you don't have to name countries, but you certainly can talk about NATO readiness levels. Uh, and you've also kind of hinted at the reforger exercise that's coming up. I mean, that, that's a very huge development. That's possibly getting back to some of the old things we used to do well, so. So there was an awful lot there. Let me try to dissect it into a couple of chunks. Um, and I, I'm going to choose a few I'd really like to talk about, so I'm sorry. The first one is you sort of mentioned SACUR's authorities. Of course, during the Cold War, the SACUR had a lot of authorities to immediately move force to what we called our GDP positions and et cetera, et cetera. And we had a whole lot more force forward. And that's kind of what I was talking about before. We're never going to have the number of people forward that we once had. But I think we in America need to have, and some of our bigger allies, we need to have a serious conversation about what kit is forward so that people could rapidly fall in on that kit uh, to constitute power faster than having to move it all, especially the heavy stuff uh, from the rear. So during the Cold War, Sakir had a lot of authorities to put forces afield. Um, when I became the SACUR, those authorities were almost completely diminished. Um, and I would just say that it's not a huge improvement, but over the course of the last three sim summits, SACUR has regained some of the authorities they need to make some of these decisions. But let's be very frank, we are nowhere near where we were, or in my humble opinion, and some may not like it, we are nowhere near where we need to be if we're going to be able to respond at threat speed. Everybody wants to talk about how we're gonna get capitals to make positions or decisions. Capitals are not gonna make decisions at threat speed. So we will, we will sacrifice initiative while capitals make decisions. And what we need to do is figure out what are, it's never going back to where it was, but we need to figure out what it takes to give SACUR the authorities to at least stop or slow the advance so then we can bring all our readiness initiatives to bear because none of them are immediate any either. The only things immediate are the forces we have forward. Um, so SACUR's authorities. 
uh, NATO's posture. NATO is headed in the right direction. Uh, I, you know me, I refuse to be political, so I'm not going to turn this into a political discussion. Right, wrong, or indifferent, during the last administration, we started to make some progress on investment by NATO nations. Um, I wasn't terribly fond of some of the tactics, techniques, and procedures to get to that point, but the fact of the matter is we had uh, a change in, in, uh, in approach by uh, many of the NATO nations and they have begun investing. And Russia has helped because they keep just blasting into everybody else's countries and seizing land. So that helps focus our nations. But NATO's posture, now that we have a new president and there seems to be a little bit different approach towards NATO, more uh, collegial, more uh, focused on maintaining an alliance, more focused on being an, a, a partner rather than sort of a, uh, uh, I don't, let's don't even go there, a, a different kind of force on NATO. And so um, my theory is that now people will say, okay, we can relax and go back to our old style and pull back on our money and start focusing on other things that win elections rather than uh, provide defense. And so one would hope, one would hope that in this new, um, new administration that we would rebuild ties into NATO. We would rebuild collegiality into NATO, but we would not, uh, would not allow NATO to fall backwards on being more prepared to help us defend it. Um, and I know that's a, those are some pretty tough words. So NADAR's posture, I think we are, we have a good momentum now. And the question is, will we maintain that momentum diplomatically as we bring aboard a new, um, new uh, administration? U.S. posture, this worries me. Um, if you remember, uh, uh, several years ago, Marty Dempsey, when asked, what is the number one threat to America and America's uh, military and defense of the country? Do you remember what he answered? He said the U.S. deficit is the number one threat to the U.S. military. And I think I agreed with Marty back then, and I still agree with that premise. The number one problem that we're going to face in the near future is truly not even Russia's nukes. It's not uh, China's uh, rebuilding of its Navy. It's, it's the deficit of the United States of America and what that's gonna mean in supporting our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that we expect to go forward and give, spend their blood for our country. And so I'm worried because COVID of course has forced us deeper into debt. And, uh, and we need to adopt those policies and practices that encourage the economy and encourage business and encourage job manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, all of this now is tied up in a horribly political, uh, political fracas. And, and so my fear is for what we're going to have to do um, uh, moving forward now in a deficit that's climbing fast in an environment which I think is going to say to the world, uh, we're going to try to keep our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, but we're not going to give them the kit they need. This is a bit personal for me. You know this. I have mm -hmm. three children by birth, two by marriage, two sons-in-law. All five of them either serve in the military or work for the military. And I don't want my children going to war in second place when it comes to kit and support. If we're gonna send our sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers to war, they need to be sent to war with the advantage and the support of a nation that says, we're not gonna put you in harm's way if, uh, in, as it relates to the funding we need to keep you number one. How long do you think it'll be before the um, you think the Biden administration will be able to uh, assess and evaluate the posture at once? I mean, I've seen reports that they've already got kind of an idea for China. 
uh, in the Pacific. The Pentagon's already started work on a China working group, but um, but well, I mean, if you just look at the budget, they're not going to be able to do almost anything to 21. There'll probably be a relatively normal mid-year review of 21 because it's in execution. And if you bust it up at that point, there's some horrible things that happens to contracts and things, you know, it'll be pretty hard to make huge changes to 21. But my expectation is 22 is it's, it's, it's on, it's fair game. It will there will be a major review and scrub of what we're doing in 22. And let me ask you, um, you know, the Munich Security Conference is always a place where people uh, in February would gather, meet, and, uh, and meet, especially on the sidelines. So what do you think is happening now that this is virtually uh, going to occur or happen, uh, but people can't really get together on the sidelines and rub shoulders and kind of talk about specifics. Um, the, this virtual environment we're in now uh, in an age of COVID um, is really fascinating. I mean, I'm just curious, you, you're probably participating in many different Munich security forums and, and now- yeah, So this interested. is an interesting conversation and we just had it a couple of days ago. I am privileged in that I've been offered to be a part of the EASLG, the European American Senior Leadership Group and Wolfgang Ischinger is in that group. Uh, I've also uh, a privilege to have been asked to join an extremely senior group called the European Leadership Network. And both sets of people, we're working on policy papers that we want to present, like we did last year, by the way, um, at the Munich Security Conference. And, and, and really, the decisions we're trying to make focus exactly on what you just said. We could exact maximum impact if we can do this in person, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and we should be on a certain timeline. If we're not going to get to in person anytime soon, and we're going to be on a timeline associated with video teleconference again, it changes the way we might roll out and where we might roll out some of these policy papers that we've been working on for months together uh, with a target of the new Biden administration and other changes or the new administration whoever that had been, and the changes that we expect to see in other governments around Europe. And so um, you're, you're spot on. The problem here is that we're in this environment where we can't do things. I mean, you're right. I've been to a lot of Munich security conferences and very little honestly happens as a result of speeches, <laughs> speeches on the stage. What happens is what's happening in all the rooms around yeah, it yeah. and all the meetings along the side and watching, I walked by in one of them and watched three heads of state shaking their finger at another head of state. And you know, some diplomacy was going on there. And so we're truly losing this in some ways. And, and um, I don't have an answer to your question. We've got a group of people that are, uh, magnitudes of a hundred smarter than me that are wrestling with this in these two groups I belong to. And we're trying to figure out together how to, to roll out <coughs> this one paper that we've been working on for a long time. Well, it's certainly going to be uh, uh, the COVID crisis is economically going to affect many different countries. And you were talking about, we we're hoping to have the investments maintained. Uh, but how can you do this when every country in the world is reeling from this, the economic tragedy that it's occurred and caused, um, which makes me wonder whether they'll still be able to, you know, kind of keep those commitments uh, as, as budgets get smaller and economy, econ economic woes uh, climb. Um, and, we mentioned I, that just a few minutes ago, so I'm, I'm not going to dig deeply back into that again. Yeah. But, but we have two NATO is the result of trying to correct two periods in our history where we allowed our, our capabilities to decline and found ourselves extremely flat-footed, didn't we? Yes. That's really grossly simplifying what happened. I know that. But the fact of the matter is the best way to prepare for war or to avoid war is to prepare for war. And if we allow ourselves to, to slip into the same places we found ourselves pre-World War I, pre-World War II, then shame on us if we ended up, end up with another ca catastrophe in Europe. 
I wanted to ask you about Poland. Uh, and I was in a meeting today where uh, I heard the former ambassador, to, uh, our outgoing ambassador speak, and she was uh, commenting about the, the, the big significance of Fifth Corps being uh, deployed to Poland and what that means for Poland. And uh, General Hodges has always emphasized that part of our abilities to, to react are, are much in the communication and command and control uh, of, the, of our forces in Europe. And that, so I think what she was alluding to is the Fifth Corps is going to have a huge, you know, major impact. How do you kind of see, um, you know, polling going forward? I mean, it looks like it's in a very good place right now uh, in terms of the U.S. commitment, uh, the transfer of U.S. forces there. So, so first of all, Poland is an incredible ally. And uh, oh my gosh, my very first meeting three and a half days into my, uh, um, into my, um, I'll sack your time. The Polish Chad, who within four months was one of my closest friends, the Polish Chad and the three Baltic Chads had me in a room at our first, uh, um, it was a MINDEF, uh, deaf men's uh, um, meeting. And they were basically giving me noogies for, you know, you got work to do to take care of us and beating me up. And it was when I walked out of there, cause I walked in with just my XO and my aid and some paper, you know, to make notes on. And uh, I came out of there a little bit black and blue, but Poland was, fighting then to do something I think they've done now, which is become a great force of uh, thought, a great force of uh, command and control, a great example of building forces to be more ready for collective de defense, Article 5. So, you know, no matter how you personally want to grade what they have done, Poland has done a great job and they're an incredible stalwart ally in an ugly neighborhood. Um, and, and we have to give them credit for that. Um, and, and like I said, uh, the Chad and I became the best of friends. And obviously, you know that after Russia invaded uh, the Donbass, I was in the Baltic nations about every two months. I was swinging through there to make sure they knew that we were still focused on them and, and we were getting ready. So. Um, uh, just a really important place for a for an ally that gets it to be in position. And you know we're we don't always agree with each other on our tactics, techniques, and procedures, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, Poland has marched forward. So Poland is is uh, in a good place. I want to just go back because most of the people that are going to watch your program will understand what you said when you when you said Fifth Corps deploying to Poland. Um, I think we all know that it's not the core, but it is a core of the core headquarters. It is an enabling capability that has moved forward um, into this battle space. And, uh, and I think it's magnificent. Why? Because now we have a core level warfighting headquarters, US warfighting headquarters, uh, a headquarters that is equipped and trained to assemble and coordinate fires, move forces to the field, work with the Air Force to bring the assets of the Air Force to the ground battle. I mean, a core headquarters is a serious capability. And so now we have a core headquarters and some part of that staff that is um, focused completely on um, this fight. And that means that we won't be stumbling into something when it happens. We will have had people that work with the Polish leaders, with the other NATO leaders that are in multinational uh, division north, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we now have some uh, US capability to marry to that NATO capability that is completely focused on a tough neighborhood. Does the Fifth Corps headquarters uh, also have implications? I know it has implications for, for how we respond in the Baltic, uh, but it also have implications further for the Arctic? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think that we would ever have a fight in Europe that didn't involve the airspace and the sea space as a minimum all the way to, into the Arctic? 
No, no. You know, people always ask me about Sweden and Finland. Magnificent, incredible uh, nations, incredibly proud and capable capable militaries. And, um, you know, uh, they always say, well, would they fight with us or would we go fight for them? The fact of the matter is I can't imagine a fight in Northern Europe that is not going to use the sea space and the airspace of Finland and Sweden. And if, if the Russians start uh, running over the top of Finland and Sweden, they're going to also be running over the top of our airspace and our sea space. You know, these things are, in my mind, inextricably linked. Uh, and so I have often answered this question exactly as I do. I, I can't imagine a fight in Northern Europe that's not going to encompass all of that battle space. Well, I was going to ask you a question about the Arctic, and I think I'll use that as a kind of a segue into the Arctic. And I know you've been involved and, and been thinking about the Arctic. Um, but recently, a, a, a Swedish friend of mine uh, was writing about the, the Russian Arctic buildup, he says, is a lot deeper and broader uh, than we think. They're positioning themselves to control the Arctic for the coming decades. Uh, their buildup involves entire Arctic, entire Arctic Ocean area and everything from policing the Northern Sea Route and economic activity to developing infantry units equipped, trained, and supported logistically to fight on all the islands and ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean. That's a big, big challenge for us if that's in true in the way the Russians are trying to develop in the Arctic. So, so that's a little bit bolder and more comprehensive statement than I've used in the past. But I've been saying since I was on active duty at now four years of my retirement, that we see a Russia that is preparing itself to be able to control these spaces. Um, it's not as easy as people think. And Russia is struggling, if you remember. I'm a civil engineer by training. The, uh, the thawing of the permafrost in the north is causing major havoc with their infrastructure. Imagine a building built on a base that was frozen forever and all of the toilet lines, water lines, electrical lines in that building. And now the base of that building begins to sag away, crack up, not become level anymore. And what happens to all those sewage lines, water lines, et cetera. Now multiply that by fuel oil lines and crude oil lines moving back and forth in there and multiply that by the really tough infrastructure to support some of these things that Russia has moved into its north, the sensors, the trying to rebuild some of the port facilities, the airfields and all of these things having to contend with whether you believe in uh, global warming or not, the fact of the matter is the ice is receding and the permafrost is melting in a lot of places where Russia is building. So yes, yes, we are faced with a problem, but so is Russia. And so uh, we have to make some policy decisions about what we're going to do. You didn't mention China. China's already made its policy decision. It's declared itself a near Arctic nation. And as you know, it's been up there in some of these nations, Greenland, Iceland, and other places trying to buy, not lease or rent, but buy land so they can hoist a, a Chinese flag and declare themselves an Arctic nation and get on the Arctic Council. China is singularly focused on being able to use that water space and that worries Russia. You know, we, I think, if all things were left to stasis, we would, we would see this as an opportunity, you know, 14 days less sea travel from Northern Europe to Asia. About the same for us if we go through that Northern Passage when it's open. Imagine how, many, how much faster you can turn ships, 28 days in a round trip. That's a whole nother month of steaming time, you know, and what that means monetarily to moving goods and things. So that the Arctic can be an opportunity. Unfortunately, uh, great nations now are posturing themselves to either guarantee passage or to control passage. Um, and let's remember, the United States of America has one operable icebreaker. And in fact, I'm not sure it's even operable right now, but we have one that we consider operable. 
So we are not exactly prepared for some of the things we need to do in the North. There was a, a discussion among military analysts recently online where they were talking about the upcoming Zapat 2021 exercises. And, and many of the experts, um, uh, many of them were from, from Scandinavia, were talking about um, the importance of this exercise for the first time they will try to do simultaneous military exercises, not just in the Arctic, but also in the Baltic. And for me, it, it, for to try to envision NATO trying to do a simultaneous military exercise in the Arctic and in the Baltic would be, wow, that would be really tough to handle and do. Yep. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is, though, remember that Russia enjoys interior lines. It's a little easier for them to be connected across ground spaces for this, where we have all these problems of air and sea space to be connected for those kinds of exercises. But I'm hearing the same thing you are. Um, I, think, I think that uh, we will see something very much in its uh, first stages if they do this, but I think the messaging is exquisite. Everybody is up on the net now that Russia has declared that the Baltics and the Arctic will be a part of Zapad. Um, and uh, I think that this is one more time where Mr. Putin plays a, a weaker hand exquisitely and his messaging is causing all the things that he would want it to cause. Yeah, I think Bob Gates used the phrase, he, Putin has a, plays a weak hand of poker, but he plays it very well. So, um, but I, you know, your point's well taken, and I, and I just want to flip it to the other side of the Arctic, because the Arctic is a pretty large place, uh, to the Bering Straits. And uh, um, uh, we all know that Senator Sullivan has really invested and tried to get the U.S. to invest in a defense strategy on the other side of the Arctic, along the Northern mm -hmm. Sea Route into Bering. Uh, and there's a heck of a lot of F-35s now uh, flying around and being deployed in Alaska. Um, and that's a by itself has a huge toll on the U.S. Air Force for trying to operate in a very cold environment. Uh, I don't know if they're operating there continuously, but there's certainly been a lot of movement and deployment there. And the Bering they, Strait. They're doing a good job of flying up there. Or we wouldn't have them there. And, you know, we've got one of the biggest training ranges in the world in Alaska. Um, we've, we've had a lot of flags up in the north there. Um, and one more thing, geographically, you know, physics is physics. And that's it's often uh, said that, uh, sadly, you can't change physics. Deploying from Alaska to multiple places, including Europe, is faster than a lot of places in the lower 48. So people forget that physics is physics, and it's faster to get either east or west from some in Alaska. So I don't, I don't belittle some of the decisions we've made there to put some key assets in a place that if we've got to come from America, it makes it quicker to respond. Um, but I, I do, I have seen those arguments um, and I would not challenge those arguments. Um, for me, I was really worried about what was coming out of the bastion spaces, those seas in the north of Russia coming down through the Guit Gap, the Greenland, Iceland, yeah. UK Gap, and, uh, and our ability to see into that water space understand that water space, of course, has gone down over the years. And we, uh, I was, my first worry actually was there uh, because the boomers and the really good attack subs coming out of those waters are something we need to be completely focused on. Well, I think you, you raised an interesting point about most of our kind of Cold War conceptions of the Arctic uh, were of Russian bastions. But as, as you talked about with the GIUK gap, uh, they're increasingly coming out. I mean, they're they're you know they're moving out beyond the gap. I mean, in, all the in way a, in into a, the Mediterranean in I mean, an aggressive way. And, much and more um, far-reaching deployment of, of the Russian Navy. Um, they have their own challenges too. You know, we've seen that. But the fact of the matter is, they've taken a decision to get out and get in the water space. And I think that they can pick the time and place of their own choosing. And I think that's kind of our problem is, is we're always, as you, you alluded to earlier about kinetic versus non-kinetic type of warfare. Uh, because it, in this day and age, it's not like them taking over uh, Trondheim and, and occupying it. It, it. It's more about them, um, 
taking control of an uh, some little island, strategic island off the coast of Estonia or in somewhere in the in the uh, Norwegian Sea. That that could be. It's more of a demoralizing impact on NATO to show that we're unable to respond. Uh, it, it seems like these type of non-kinetic efforts are, are. Think about the shots out of the Caspian Sea into Syria. If those assets, both either underwater or on the surface, were off the east coast of America, draw that arc. Hmm. Well, let me uh, move to a topic uh, you're very interested in, and that's concerning Romania. Uh, and we have, under the European Reassurance Initiative, uh, under actually under the Trump administration, they increased it to close to eight billion. It's been reduced now to three billion, but there's been a heck of a lot of investment in. Uh, the Air Force infrastructure in Eastern Europe, and, and it's certainly one thing that's very obvious is that Romania is becoming the, the key hub uh, in the Black Sea, and, and that great uh, drone, you, you very much like, the, the Reaper has now been based and deployed in Romania. What, so what are your impressions about Romania and its importance in Black Sea security? Well, um, it, it's incredibly important. And, uh, and I don't want to get too personal, but they've had a great leader there for a while, Nico Chuka, who is currently their Minister of Defense. I worked with him when he was leading their army, and then I worked with him when he became the Chief of Defense, and now he's moved on, and I'm still talking to him, just exchanged emails yesterday. And so they've got great leadership that has a vision of how Romania is not just a give me nation, but Romania is a nation that contributes deeply to the common defense of NATO in the Black Sea, making uh, um, uh, available land and capabilities like Aegis Ashore and others. And so um, Romania is, is stepping up to the plate to be that model, former Warsaw Pact era kind of force that has grown into a a real NATO capable ally. And, uh, and I'm not saying that others haven't, but Romania has clearly stayed on a very aggressive path to be there. And they are in a great position. I mean, we've watched Russia build this A to AD capability uh, on the peninsula um, in Crimea and around Sevastopol. And, 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 and so what is NATO's answer? And so NATO has demonstrated resolve by sailing more ships. You saw three U.S. ships recently in there, uh, including a supply ship. Um, uh, and we see other nations, as well as the United States, moving capabilities forward to exercise and establish a, a pattern of presence that is important. And while uh, I think there's some confusion out there on the words that are being used about permanent basing, but I think what we're going to see now is this persistent basing of Reapers forward. And of course, the Reaper is a magnificent tool as an intelligence gatherer, way different than it was years ago. And secondarily, extremely lethal, as we have seen through the course of the last decade uh, in using it. And so uh, I think it's a great, um, I think it's a great capability. It makes a statement of commitment to NATO in the Black Sea region. And uh, I applaud it, frankly. And I'm glad that the new administration has determined to carry on and go forward with it. I think it's, it brings an important uh, capability and message uh, to Mr. Putin in the Black Sea. And the may MK I just stray from your question sure. and say one thing else that may generate more questions, but we have a great ally on the southern end of the Black Sea. And there are those out there in the world that want to write off Turkey. That is a huge mistake in my mind. We need to embrace Turkey. We need to find a path forward that keeps this ally in our alliance. And we need to figure out how to work through some of these pretty tough problems that we all know about um, and, and try to get out on the backside. I was once asked uh, recently about, this is the worst it's ever been in NATO. 
I say, wait a minute. We were thrown out of a country. Our <laughs> headquarters was thrown out. They had to get on the road and march north into Belgium. Uh, this is not as bad as it's been. And we will find a way, as we did with that great country, to move forward. And we just need to keep focused on the fact that Turkey is an important part of our lives. Uh, end of preaching. Well, do you think that, um, you, so you, on the one side, Romania and the Black Sea, and then you've got Turkey. So uh, the, the interesting thing I think you, you said to me in my mind is the pattern of presence. Uh, that's a very interesting kind of observation because they've, you know, they have had a kind of a pattern of presence. They, dis, they deployed the USS Whidbey uh, to the Black Sea right after the Kirk well, Strait. Uh, not to interrupt, but remember we stationed those four destroyers in Rota, and one of their missions was going to be have presence, rotational presence in the Black Sea. It was about the East Med, yes. It was about a lot of things. It was about um, ballistic missile defense, yes. It was about a lot of things, but part of it was to have presence. And we have sailed all of those destroyers multiple times through the Black Sea in a US presence in a contribution to NATO. So I think that uh, what I would love to see is Turkish leadership in putting together sort of a Black Sea pleasant presence fleet and, and draw other nations into this more NATO styled uh, um, appropriate uh, level of, of presence in the Black Sea. We can't allow uh, the Russian Navy or Mr. Putin to think of as this there is their exclusive domain. You had mentioned in an email um, that the oiler that was sent uh, into the Black Sea was significant beyond just the words of being an oiler. Uh, can, go, can you go into that just a little bit on, on why you thought that was well, so important? Well, one more time, it's an important signal. I mean, um, um, we what we have said is that we're willing and capable of putting sustainment in there for larger forces. A single destroyer sailing through the Black Sea can make a couple of trips and not need a lot of support, you know? But if we put a force in there, and we had as much as three in there at one point, if we put a force in there, and if NATO brings a force in there, the fact that we have sailors that are capable and experienced in sailing in these waters and doing the business they have to do sometimes under the A2 AD of Crimea. You know, this is an important uh, capability and it's an important statement of commitment in my mind. But how do you deal when, say you're getting ready to have an exercise in the Black Sea and then the Russians say announce, well, we're having snap exercises and everything in this, this all zone the time needs to get- And they call exclusion zones and all Right, right, so how do you deal with that? I mean, is it, is you, a, a, you just, you you do just call off your own exercises? Yeah, you do a freedom of navigation right through it. Oh, well, that hasn't happened yet. So, I mean, <laughs> or have we? I missed it. Uh, I, I will just sit on that one. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll see that in the off the horizon there. Listen, um, there's something been very near and dear to your heart, and and that is you've been an avid watcher of the of the war in Karabakh. Uh, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, the, the heavy usage of drones, you've been uh, really talking that up and, and putting a lot of emphasis on what its implications were for NATO. And could I just kind of let you ask you to share? Uh, yeah, my, my observations are, are relatively simplistic, so I hope they meet the, your audience's desires. My very first concern was, we now have an active conflict where Russia, Iran, Turkey were involved. So we have three easily described regional powers and maybe a couple of world powers that are involved on different sides of a conflict. Um, and and the, 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 the possibility of an ugly result is just uh, could, is, we're still not past it, frankly but it was pretty high and it worried me. You know, now we've got this uh, peace effort in there, Turks and Russians who sometimes get along, sometimes don't get along and how that's gonna play out. And are we gonna have a residual large Russian force there a la Transnistria and other places 
you know, there's a lot of bad outcomes that come that could come from this, and that uh, that um, is important. Okay, you and I talked a little bit a, a while back in this interview about our our uh, unreadiness to do some of the things that used to be second nature. Here we had a large armored force that came under air attack, where the air forces attacking had battlefield superiority as a minimum, if not absolute air superiority. And, and what happened? That heavy force uh, took really ugly losses and lost ground. And in, in my mind, lost the conflict. And uh, what does that tell us about uh, uh, how we need to be prepared if we're going to put heavy forces in the field again. Remember what I've said in other speeches with you. When was the last time that a U.S. soldier uh, or Marine on the ground lost his life to a fixed wing attack? You know the date? No. Spring of 53 in the Korean conflict. We have put a minimum of uh, air battlefield air superiority, and in most cases, absolute air superiority, and in a few cases, air supremacy over our fielded forces. Ever since then, we've lost uh, we've lost troops to scuds, but not to fixed wing attack, and that's because we, the combined air forces, not the air force, but the naval air, the air force air, the army air, the marine air have provided uh, that flexibility and right to our American sail soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines on the ground or afloat. And um, we saw what happened to Armenia when they didn't have that in the presence of just RPAs. You know, I don't like the word drones, but in the presence of these remotely piloted aircraft, uh, they extracted a tough, tough toll on Armenia. And what does it tell me? Also, Russia has gotten much better at that kill chain. The small three meter and I think five meter drones they were flying in there. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. Azerbaijan flying the Turkish uh, RPAs into the airspace. This kill chain has been really worked well. We saw it in Donbass when we would see the small RPAs married to the Grad rocket system. And now we see it one more level up near varsity level in Armenia or in this conflict where Azerbaijan uh, tied their RPAs to uh, the kill chains uh, that they brought to the battlefield. It's a terrible thing if you're not ready. And so we need introspection on our forces. Are we ready today to prepare uh, battlefield air superiority to air air supremacy for our troops. Could we do that in Central Europe? But the use of fixed wing aircraft is, is in warfare is kind of an escalation. You saw the Donbass, how the Russians uh, and the Ukrainians both kind of held back their use of aviation uh, uh, involved in ground attack. But you've now seen in, in Idlib and in Karabakh, you've seen heavy, heavy attrition by drones while the, while the Air Force basically fixed wing stood back and, 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 and a war. Just remember fought. how that works. Now, air supremacy doesn't have to be brought by, um, by uh, fixed wing airplanes. If you've got the right SAM capability, if you've got the right ability to sanitize airspace, and that's what happened in the Donbass. It was a whole lot more about the Russian SAMs than it was their aircraft. And so you're right, they didn't use their aircraft because they didn't have to. And remember, you probably have the numbers, how high the attrition was of the Ukrainian Air Force when they tried to go into that space. And so they ended up ceding the airspace to Russia and grounding their fleet because they couldn't afford to keep losing them. So Russia gained this air superiority without having to use its fixed wing. So we, you know, as an airman, if I don't have to fly my airplanes and put my airmen at risk, that's awesome. If I've got the right kind of fad, patriot, 
uh, AMRAM, you know, all of these things right down to the stingers that can guarantee battlefield air superiority above my troops. I'm happy not to put my airplanes at risk. Uh, um, but the good news is uh, our soldier, sailors, airmen, and Marines have been protected by the air campaign of all four services. Uh, uh, and we sometimes take that for granted. I don't think we can take that for granted in the uh, central plains of Europe anymore. So that true about great power conflict, but in these wars and these regions, Transnistria, Karabakh, you know, Donbass, Kerch Strait, whatever, you have these areas where there's kind of this fighting designed to send a message and it's short, it's quick, but, but it also is not, it's, it's more designed for statements. Now, yes, you're, the, you're wearing your NATO hat, but there's also these smaller powers now that are starting to duke things out uh, and, and send messages to one another. And I would say the Turks in Idlib in February of last year really bloodied the noses of the Russians. Yep. Uh, and, and then basically, and Putin stood down basically at the end of the day. And, and, and so that to me is, is, has a lot of messages um, because these nations are actually fighting every day or continuously and getting a lot of battlefield experience. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where I'm, um, I think that that's a, their experience they're getting. And that's why you think Karabakh is important. We need to sit back and kind of learn from it. So. Yep. No, I, I think there's a lots of lessons to be learned from this war and it, and it's not about small force on force. It's about how we expect to take the battlefield of the future. And if we are in a position where we do not have air supremacy or superiority, at least temporarily over our troops, uh, we would have never been able to build up for the first Gulf War if uh, Iraq had had an air force that could have reached, how vulnerable were those just hundreds and thousands of acres of supplies that we amassed moving in there. It wouldn't have taken more than one or two really good bomber runs to put all of that at risk. Uh, but we were able to amass this massive logistics hub because we knew that we controlled the air over it. And so we've got to rethink that into our future. Well, I hope that it, when we do rethink that, that we'll have you as a part of, of any of these discussions. I, I think you, you've been very generous with your time today. Uh, and Eastern Approaches is designed to kind of explore and talk and, and uh, evaluate what's going on in the world. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can have you again uh, in another in the near future in six months, uh, hopefully not, not after another war like Karabakh, but sometime. Uh, but Jeffrey well, I've enjoyed it as, as I always do. And um, I must say that the conversations that you allow me to be in, in some of your email circles, bring some incredible uh, experts to the conversation. And I learned a lot more than I added on these conversations uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh. And well, so yes, I appreciate being uh, brought into your circle of conversation. And I enjoyed tonight. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and we look forward to talking to you again and, uh, and wish all our viewers who are watching Eastern Approaches uh, the short but simple happy trails. So take care and we'll see you again. Keep moving, moving, moving. Oh, they're just a-proving. Keep them doggies moving.